Alright, hello everybody and welcome back to another new video. Today we're talking about the newest episode uh, for Boruto, Boruto episode 90. Uh, I almost said 89 for some reason, but 90. And this episode I think was actually very solid. I thought it was a pretty good episode. Uh, there's a lot of character moments that I thought were done pretty well. Uh, m m mainly Mitsuki because he was kind of like the focus of the episode because the title of the episode is literally titled Mitsuki and Sakie. So it makes sense that the focus was kind of on Mitsuki, but he was only in it for only a short amount of time, it feels like. Because a lot of it showed uh, Boruto and Sarada and what, and what they were doing. Some other stuff that happened, uh, uh, like Kurosuchi, like she shows up in the episode. And then once again, um, <laughs> Konohamaru doesn't show up in, in the episode. I thought he was going to show up in the last episode. Uh, something happens in this episode that... I thought that was, I was going to warrant him showing up again, but no, he's just, he just got shafted again by not being in the episode once more. So the episode starts off with what do you think it's going to start off with? It starts off with uh, Ku, you know, being injured because, you know, Mitsuki had betrayed Sekie, Ku, and the others, you know, these fabrications, and he attacked them. He attacked them from behind when his guard was down. Ku, obviously being a fabrication and doesn't have a human heart, is obviously decomposing and breaking down. He's not going to be able to last much longer. So in the episode, what happens is that he leaves. Uh, Boruto and Sarada uh, are trying to go after him because Mitsuki told them to. Uh, those two get in a fight with Kira, and then um, Ku uh, goes back to like the facility, like the scientific place with the science guy. I don't even know that guy's name. It never actually gave his name. Weird. <laughs> I guess that's. I guess we shouldn't feel bad that he ends up dying in the episode. Basically, the um, reason why I say he basically ends up dying in the episode is because uh, just before, like I think, it's like, I think it's about like halfway through, like the episode where they show it, but it doesn't do the reveal until the end of the episode. So, like I think about halfway through the episode, what happens is that Ku gets back. Uh, he asks like the scientist guy, like, "Hey, I need a human heart." Do you have one? He's like, no, obviously we don't have one because Mitsuki had, you know, obviously betrayed them and he let out all the stone shinobi that were prepped to be given, uh, they were prepped to have their hearts transplanted out. You know, they were, they all escaped because of Mitsuki. So Ku does the only thing that he says, or not says, but the only thing he thinks that's, you know, possible at this current moment and he decides to basically kill the scientist guy like i'm saying like he died and like he got killed but like let's be honest he he got killed like there's no way he, he like ku didn't kill him because at this point he's gone full insane right so ku kills the science guy and he he implants the heart onto his body not really directly inside of him because it's a part of him but it's like outside and it's exposed and like obviously they made it look a certain way to where it's like not unappealing to look at, but it's still not appealing to look at. And I'm just really curious what they're going to do with that. Cause you know, now that the heart is exposed, like kind of right. I'm wondering like, is that his weak, weak spot now? Like that's a really bad place to put up, to put the heart. Like obviously it makes sense, but it's like, it's really bad to have it exposed like that. Especially with the previews where it shows like he has nothing protecting it whatsoever. And so I'm just like, uh, well, okay, he's going to die quickly, I guess. <laughs> Maybe not, because Ku is actually... He's not fodder material, you know? He's He shows to be kind of strong, but if he loses the, the Borto, then it's like, oh, yeah, he's fodder tier. But if he loses the, like, Onoki, who's like... He's, he's like, yeah, and he's an old man, but he's still, like, Onoki. He's, he, he was a previous Hokage, so I feel like it wouldn't be nearly as bad if Ku loses to Onoki instead of, like, Borto or someone. Um... But before we get into Mitsuki and uh, Sakie, uh, Kirara, like I said, had went and intervened with Sarada and Boruto when they were trying to go after Ku, and those two start fighting. And the episode does the whole thing where they they bring back Gataga again, because we haven't seen Gataga for a few episodes now. It's actually been like a while since we saw Gataga or like just any like anything revolving around him. Like he just was wasn't doing doing anything. But then I watched the review before doing... I watched someone else review the episode before I did my own, as you can tell already, because you're watching it. But they were talking about how they they thought it was weird, how Gadaga was talking to Borto, like how Kurama did with 
with Naruto, right? Because yeah, it's really weird because you know the the you're summoning animal like for example with the toads, they're on Mount Miyaboku, and you can't directly talk to them like telepathically, like at all. You can only talk to them when you finally summon them to your obvious location. That's the only time you can really talk to them. But for some reason, Gadaga was able to telepathically speak to Boruto. But that's not possible, or at least that shouldn't be possible, because A, Gadaga isn't sealed with inside Boruto, like the Nine Tails was with Naruto, and Gadaga should be at Ryuji Cave, because all your summoning animals, if you sign a contract to summon snakes, they should all be at Ryuji Cave. But for some reason... Gadaga just seems like he's being able he's able to talk telepathically to Borto for some reason. Now, I don't know if there's like an obvious explanation that they could do to explain that. Maybe just I don't know. There's not really anything that really comes to mind that can, you know, justify how Gadaga was able to do that in the first place. It seems very weird. But I guess I'm not really gonna fault it because they do something really cool in the episode where they they get an Akuta, like Kirara gets gets like a giant like akuta like it's about like similar of the size of gataga like it's about the same size as like a, su a summoning animal like gataga for example like i said and so it's huge so boruto summons gataga and the this giant like akuta summoning like thing it's not really like a summon it's kind of like a combination of like all these akuta kind of together it seems like because Kirara had like all these other Akuta and they went down in the ground and then came back up as that giant thing. But they have like this big ass like fight with Gadaga and the Akuta and it was really cool because I feel like the summoning jutsu is like one of the coolest techniques of all of the series, but they never utilized it. And I think that's the reason why people really liked the, the, the summoning jutsu whenever Jiraiya used it in his fight against Pain and Conan. Because it seemed like Jiraiya was for some reason, the only one who thought it would be smart to get this giant creature to help out and fight. And it was the same thing with Naruto when he was fighting Pain in the Leaf Village. And that was really cool. And then they did it again here. And I was like, dude, that's so cool. I love seeing this, these these just giant creatures like fighting against each other. That's, that's so awesome because you don't really see that too often in the Naruto series. And before someone in the comments is going to say something like, well, yeah, but Naruto spammed the hell out of, out of his Kurama avatar thing whenever he was in his QB chakra mode. And like, yeah, but that's an exception. They were under a war. They were in war. You, you don't see that in like casual like shinobi missions where you think it would be smart to do that. And I feel like Borzo, along with the viewers, kind of forgot that Gar Gara kind of existed anyway. So it's, it's kind of weird how that just seemed to work out. But... Nevertheless, Gataga ends up defeating uh, the Yakuta, and Sabata and Kirara actually have a little scuffle. And I say scuffle because it wasn't really that much of a fight. Kirara was already breaking down and uh, you know, from her body anyways, and she was already pretty much going to die regardless, right? But Sabata, being a freaking savage, decides to attack her from behind. So she gets a sneak attack on her, right? And what Sabata decides to do is she takes a hit, but obviously she's not going to die because plot armor and she's a main character. But she uses um, the Sharon gun, like ocular genjutsu, and, you know, makes it seem like Kirara stabbed her. Obviously, you know, it's a genjutsu, so Sawada's just like, ha, psych, <laughs> psych. And um, Sawada is right behind Kirara, and she hits her with uh, the lightning style lightning ball that she had previously copied before during the Mist Village arc. Kirara is just there. She's freaking out. She's pissed off. And then, again, Sawada, like a freaking savage, just allows a, this giant boulder from the Akuta, like, because it was kind of like made out of the Akuta and the Earth. This giant boulder just lands on Kirara and she dies. And I'm just like, God damn, you couldn't even be, like, like, nice enough to, like, pick her up and move her out of the way? Like... Die, let her die in like a more humane way like god <laughs> i was like really surprised I thought, I thought that was gonna happen i was like yeah let her die like somewhat peacefully like like she wasn't all bad realistically but goddamn like her you know obedience to coup and being evil-esque right was just like really like i don't know it just seemed weird that sourda just decided to let let it happen like, she was going to die anyway, but you couldn't let her die in, like, a more 
humane and like human way, considering that these fabrications, you know, seem more human like more than just created beings like the Yakuza. It was really weird. I don't know. It was really weird. So the fight with Sekie and Mitsuki starts in the beginning of the episode, and it starts off really slow. And it starts off slow like how you think it does because Sekie has, you know, the Kiki Genkai for explosion style or explosion release. So obviously, you know, he's going to start fighting from a distance. But the entire time, Mitsuki isn't attacking him, right? Because Mitsuki still sees Sekie as an ally, as a friend, as someone that he cares about. Right? And that was like the whole point of Mitsuki fighting him in the first place, that he isn't fighting back, he's just dodging and running away because he wants to help him, and he he wants him, you know, to give him a heart because Orochimaru, he says Orochimaru could do potentially the same thing that he did with himself. And maybe that could have happened, who knows? Maybe that could have happened if Sakie just decided to go along with it. But obviously, you know, Sakie being a fabrication, his body not being able to hold up for much longer... He falls on the ground, and he starts giving a little, I guess, monologue. Not really a monologue, but him and me, he start talking to each other. He realizes, like, the thing that made him stronger was him caring so much for Borto and him seeing Borto as a friend and him being his son, you know, and just the motivation that has Mitsuki, you know, becoming stronger like the way he is. And, you know, Sakei realized that. Sakei realized that, and he gets the final acknowledgement that Mitsuki saw him as a friend through the end you know regardless of of Mitsuki finally seeing like these like the extension that they were they're, they were willing to go to like regardless of that you know Mitsuki saw Saki as a friend regardless right and he cared about him and that's why he would he wanted to help him and then Saki just dies and they have a really sad moment where he where he's like wanting to get like full acknowledgement of it where their acknowledgement of it and they're about to do like the fist bump thing that the, the series is kind of known for. Like how Naruto always does like a fist bump with others to show that like he acknowledges them as like a friend and as an ally. The same thing was about to happen with Sakie and Mitsuki, but Sakie dies. Sakie dies and his arm literally crumbles away and they weren't able to finally get that final, you know, uh, acknowledgement for that, that, for that to happen before he's just gone, right? And I thought they were going to do something that I thought they were going to, that they established in the previous episode, where Mitsuki has never cried before, right? They made that a plot point in one of the episodes, but for some reason they didn't make him cry. And I don't know if they're trying to save that for next week. I feel like it'd be really strange that they're trying to save that for next week. Like, what could possibly happen next week that doesn't, that didn't... <sighs> What could have, what could possibly happen that you know pushes him to the brink of tears that didn't happen this week? I feel like it's just a really odd choice for him to not to not cry here, you know, because they made it a plot point in the previous episode, like I said. But for some reason, he just doesn't cry here. It's really weird. And the reason why it makes sense for him to cry here, it's because you know he grew close with Sekie. He grew to become a friend of Sekie, and the same thing is vice versa. So it just seemed really weird that. Sakie Mitsuki's, you know, friend dies in front of him, and then he's just, he just doesn't, like, he kind of brushes it off, like, it's almost nothing, right? So, Mitsuki changes clothes really quickly, mind you, mind you, but he meets back up with Borto and Sarada, and Borto is, you know, finally getting back, uh, or getting into the swing of things of, like, yeah, if I want to be more of a friend to Mitsuki than I was previously before... I need to hear him out. I need to talk to him more. I need to learn about him more because that was the whole point of this arc in the first place. Mitsuki felt like he was just a fabrication with his own will and his, you know, own feelings and emotions and memories. He felt like that was all fabricated and that wasn't him, you know, getting those experiences. He felt like those were just created things from when Orochimaru like created him. But as we know, Orochimaru didn't plan for that to happen. That wasn't his plan for Mitsuki in the first place. And, Throughout this whole entire entire journey, Borto is starting to like learn and you know realize that hey, I need to do the same thing that I've been doing with all my other friends to Mitsuki. You know that's very rude. That's very rude that I haven't been doing that, and I want to improve upon that. And that's what he's doing here. He's like, okay, obviously something happened before you got here, but we just, we'll talk about that later, right? And 
he's giving that acknowledgement to Mitsuki that Boruto wants to, you know, be there for, for him more as a friend, right? And he says that later, and it's not inconsiderate. It's the whole fact that Ku is literally comes out like immediately after, and they're about to start a, a freaking scuffle. So it makes sense, right? So they'll talk about it later. They're gonna talk about it when they get to the Leaf Village. The episode, like I said, ends off with Ku showing that he implanted the heart in himself. And the previews show that Anoki's going to show up. Maybe he's going to sacrifice himself. Honestly, if there's a time to kill off Anoki, it has to be this episode and this arc and this series. Because not only is he a really old man that, you know, is shockingly still alive, but I feel like it just makes sense to kill him off in this arc specifically because, you know, he did like a really, you know, terrible thing by creating these fabrications this you know basically human life and then they terrorized all these people in the stone village and you know he's finally acknowledging like yeah he did something wrong and he wants to make terms and you know try to what's the word i'm looking for he wants to make up for that you know he wants to make up for all the wrongdoings that he's done throughout his entire life and especially this one so i feel like it makes sense for him to you know self-sacrifice himself for the better of the village by getting rid of Ku. And, you know, maybe they'll do that. Maybe they won't. Honestly, I'll be really surprised if they don't do that because it just, it makes sense to do it in, you know, in the next episode. And this arc, because he doesn't really serve any purpose any longer. You know, you could, th- you could say the same thing for Kakashi and A and like all the previous, ho- you know, like, not Hokage, but Kage. Um, but with Onoki, like specifically, it makes the most sense. I, I kind of hope that they kill him off so they could redeem his character because his character has done a lot of bad things, especially in this arc and from what we learned of what he's done. But I just hope that they do it. I hope that they, re- they redeem his character by having him you know self-sacrifice himself. And it'll just be good. It'll just be good for his character. But we're going to have to wait until next week for to see what happens. Uh, return back to the channel if you're interested in my opinions and thoughts about it. And yeah, that's pretty much it. The episode just ends off with a preview of Anoki fighting Ku. Ku's doing some stuff. Everyone's doing some stuff. And then Mitsuki puts puts his headband back on, his leaf headband back on. So that's going to be cool. Anyways, that's the end of the episode, which means that's the end of the video. If you did enjoy, be sure to leave a like. And if you are new, subscribe for more videos just like this. Um, uh, I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Go check out my previous video because I did a review on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Uh, long story short, I didn't think the game as the Creed game was that good, but as an action RPG, it was okay. Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a fantastic day. I'm out. Peace. Drop that